Okay, well, welcome back, everybody. Um, thank you to our second session, to Nicholas Mock, to Meredith Martin and Jillian Weiss and Elliot Sertovent. Uh, we will here uh, begin our third panel, which is on energy, which explores some of the uh, technological and environmental components um, of maritime architecture and design. Um, I'd like to welcome Sarah Rich, who is a professor in the art history program at Coastal Carolina University. She will be presenting a project architecture in the Anthropocene. All right, hello everyone. Um, thank you so much to the organizers of this conference for inviting me to present. Um, and I, uh, I really do feel very honored uh, to be amongst um, this, this group of, um, of, of thinkers and, um, uh, and I'm just ha very happy to be learning from um, your expertise. Um, I would also like to um, make it known that I live and work on the, the traditional tribal lands of the Waccamaw Indian people. And I'm also grateful for their hospitality. Um, and I uh, do my best to try to um, respect this land and their ancestors and their culture um, and um, also the waters, of course, where, uh, where I'm a guest. So uh, there, were, there wasn't a, a slight change from our first conversations about this talk um, between uh, Jason, Christy, and myself. Um, and uh, so the, the title of the talk is now Fragic Architecture and a Theory of Failure. However, I have to warn you that this alleged theory of failure is very preliminary. Um, and uh, so I would, I would welcome your suggestions for further reading. Um, this is definitely a work in progress. Um, all right, so let's see. I also wanted to um, mention that the talk that I'm giving today stems from two um, previous works, one of which is my uh, most recent book, Shipwreck, Hontography, Underwater Ruins in the Uncanny, uh, which just came out from Amsterdam University Press last fall. So you can uh, find it at the, at the publisher's website. And I think um, you can also download the first, the first chapter or maybe even the first two chapters for free. Um, and then I'm also um, drawing heavily in this talk and, and expanding on it uh, from a paper called Naufragic Architecture in the Anthropocene, from, uh, which is the, the title that Jason mentioned earlier. Um, and uh, this was co-authored with Leela Hamdan and Justa Hamble, Justina Hamble of the University of Southern Mississippi. Um, this is coming out in an edited volume uh, with my, my co-editor, Peter Campbell, um, called Contemporary Philosophy for Maritime Archaeology. And uh, this is going to be an open access book um, from Sidestone Press. So um, please, uh, if, if this material interests you at all, then uh, you might keep an eye out for that book, uh, which should be coming out. Um, hopefully by the end of this year. So, and feel free to, um, you know, to reach out to me via, via email and um, I'll put you on a, on a list. All right. Um, so I'd like to start off this talk with a very um, often cited quotation from the, the philosopher Paul Virilio. The invention of the ship was also the invention of the shipwreck. Now, um, Obviously, uh, this is uh, this has to do. This resonates a lot with this uh, this alleged theory of failure that I'm that I'm sort of working on in relation to shipwreck, um, and and I think probably everyone in this audience is is familiar enough with Virilio's writing to know that he's talking about he's giving us a sort of caution, um, a, a cautionary bit of advice that we should always be thinking about the inevitable failure of the technologies that we, uh, you know, that that we bring into fruition, that inevitably the ship will wreck. Um, and we ought to be prepared for the consequences of that wreckage. And some of it, sometimes the consequences of wreckage, of course, involve the taking of human lives. But in every instance, the consequences of wreckage has um, ecological, uh, um, uh, you know, um, either benefits, it either benefits an ecosystem or it comes, the, the wreckage comes at a detriment to that ecosystem. And that's kind of what I'm going to be talking about today. So maybe we can just keep this quote in the back of our minds as, as we move on. All right, um, as this painting by, uh, by Turner would suggest, again, uh, the wreckage often comes, uh, there's a tragic side to it. However, I don't think that any of us in this symposium 
uh, you know, would argue against the idea that ships are marvelous works of architecture. Um, and, uh, and, you know, just uh, marvels of engineering and probably always have been as long as humans have been making ships and, and boats for, you know, probably at least 60,000 years. Um, and yet these works of architecture, marvelous though they are, um, are still doomed to fail. And so when they do, when they do sink to the seafloor, as is what often, often happens in scenarios like the one uh, painted uh, by Turner here, um, that, uh, that architectural form, that marvel, suddenly and very dramatically begins to change. So the, the question is, you know, do, to what extent do we still consider this a work of architecture? Now, this, this question may seem, you know, somewhat asinine or maybe overly simplistic, but I think that the, the answer is perhaps a little bit more complicated than what it may, um, what it may seem. So I'd like to turn to, um, to uh, Graham Harmon, um, who is a contemporary philosopher who works at the intersection of philosophy and architecture, at least um, as of late. And he's introduced this concept of zero form, zero function that I think can go a long way toward answering that, um, that uh, ostensibly simple question that was posed in the previous slide. So if we think about, um, he, he says basically, uh, from what I understand, um, he says basically that a successful work of architecture sort of um, has this, this sense of zero form, zero function. And so if we think about um, the ship as a work of architecture, in, in, in the sense that it has zero form, it sort of surpasses its form in some way. And so, um, you know, the, the, the ship may become a, a sort of metaphor, like a when you're on board a ship, it becomes a heterotopia, of course, um, but also something like a, like a floating forest, or as was the case um, with the galleons um, of the early modern period, a floating castle. And so it takes on so, some sort of form that sort of surpasses this originary state. Um, likewise, with zero function, um, we have numerous examples, of course, of, of ships that have been refitted, you know, sailing vessels that were refitted with steam engines, um, and these sort of transformations of, of how the ship functions happen all the time. We might also think of, of not necessarily how the ship functions, but also, um, but also its, its, uh, its telos, right, it's its original function. And that often also changes and sort of surpasses the uh, the original um, anthropogenic design of the ship when it becomes, when it stops sort of sailing across the sea and moving across the surface of the water and becomes permanently docked at a port to become a tourist attraction or to house a museum or something like that. And you see that function sort of changing. And I think we can say the same for shipwrecks where um, obviously the, the form alters again, you know, dramatically as the, um, the, the broken ship sinks to the bottom of the sea, it becomes covered in sediment, it begins to disintegrate. Um, marine life starts to uh, become attracted to this hard substrate um, and things change very dramatically for the broken ship. Um, and again, that, that, that sort of surpasses or maybe even bottoms out the original form. Likewise, um, zero function, again, the, the ship's original function was to sit at the top of the water and, and to act as a transporter between various land masses. However, when the ship breaks, obviously its function, uh, its anthropogenic function changes uh, dramatically and it starts to have new meaning to new life forms. So if we can agree, and I realize that this is probably a big if at this point, if we can agree that the shipwreck is a work of architecture, then who then would be its architects? And so for this, um, we might turn to the biological work of um, uh, this, uh, this trio of, of biologists who published a paper in 1994 called Organisms as Ecosystem Engineers. And in this paper, um, the authors argue that non-human organisms are also engineers of, of ecosystems in that they um, maintain ecosystems, they modify ecosystems, and they also build or create new ecosystems. And we can see this even in the, um, you know, this you know, somewhat random example here of a shipwreck where you can see that there are many different kinds of organisms that have attached themselves to this site and have started to uh, you know, change these forms according to their, their own design, their own agenda. Now, obviously, um, you know, the, the, the process of this starts with, uh, with micro, uh, microorganisms that uh, create a biofilm over the surface of the wreck. 
And uh, that's the, the sort of starting point that kicks off this whole um, re-engineering of, of, uh, of the wreckage um, by these, these non-human architects. Um, there are, of course, um, you know, there can be impediments to this process as well, where um, if, you know, the, the rate of this re-engineering really depends a lot on the construction materials of the ship itself. And not only the construction materials, but also the cargo and the toxicity thereof. And of course, the method of propulsion, where over time, um, you know, oil uh, containers uh, and, and petroleum containers rust, these tanks rust through and then, um, and then leak out into the, surrounding, um, into the surrounding ecosystem. And we see this happening um, a lot, especially with the, uh, the wreckage of the World War I and World War II, this so widely distributed throughout um, Earth's oceans. But when these, um, these, these ecosystem uh, engineers really get to work, we start to see that the shipwreck site functions as a, as a discrete system, as a sort of like, uh, it's, it's entirely cut off from its original design and it becomes something that we might consider like an autonomous machine. And um, <clears throat> this is, I, I think, a kind of interesting way of, of looking at shipwrecks because obviously we've been talking the whole day about, about ships as sea machines. And what I want to say is that, that the shipwreck is also a type of sea machine. And I'm going to turn to um, contemporary philosopher Levi Bryant, who in his um, 2014, I think it was, book, Onto Cartography, um, prefers, in, instead of talking about things or objects or units, to refer to discrete individual things um, as, as machines, as sort of nested machines that, you know, that, uh, that are composed of machines and also compose yet other machines. And he develops this kind of um, elaborate classification system for all these different types of machines. And I, I would like to argue that the, the shipwreck actually acts, and I think actually that Levi Bryant would probably disagree with me on this. I think that Levi Bryant would refer to a shipwreck as an inanimate corporeal machine, but I wanna to try to offer um, a way of thinking about the shipwreck as an animate corporeal machine. And so if we think about this sort of the ship as a, as a broken body, and as we saw um, in uh, Nicholas's talk that, uh, that ships are often linked to bodies, particularly feminine bodies. And so this is, this is not too far-fetched, right? So if we think of the, the ship as a, as a broke, or the shipwreck as a broken body, it is composed then of other bodies, the bodies of marine organisms, of course, that of course composes yet another body of water. And we see that this, this system of the, the shipwreck site is actually self-organized um, and, it, and it grows. And this is an important feature that distinguishes the animate um, from the inanimate corporeal machine. Um, and I would argue that it is uh, that it does have those features, that it is self-organized and it does grow as new colonizers become attracted to the site, marine colonizers, of course, and as the site um, accretes new materials, um, as it experiences chemical reactions with seawater, even though old materials might break away. So the site is undergoing this sort of constant change. Um, and at the same time, it is also uh, discrete and, um, and autonomous. Now, there are other classification systems that are much more popular. However, I don't think um, are quite as, uh, as useful and maybe not even as, as accurate. <clears throat> so, if we consider the, the sort of governing body of underwater cultural heritage, um, which, is, uh, which is UNESCO, the United Nations branch um, that, is, that deals with the domains of education, science, and culture, um, they use classification systems that are uh, strictly divided between nature and culture. So we have natural, cultural, natural heritage on the one hand and cultural heritage on the other. And we could talk all day about the, uh, the difficulties and the, the, the problems of the nature-culture divide, um, but I suspect that if I were to do that right now, I would probably be preaching to the choir. So suffice it to say that this uh, nature culture divide sort of filters in to the, a divide between marine and maritime. So for instance, we have mar marine biologists on the one hand, maritime archeologists on the other. One deals with nature, the other with culture. And I think that there are, there are some problems um, associated with that. But uh, for the sake of time, um, I think that one of the one of the primary concerns with um, with labeling shipwreck sites, for instance, as, as sites of underwater cultural heritage, 
is that we see that the, that label of culture includes the works of man as well as the combined works of nature and man. I would like to just pose a sort of rhetorical question here. Is there even such a thing as a work of man that doesn't involve whatever nature is? I find that sort of hard to believe, um, considering that we are um, nothing but bipedal biomes to begin with. So uh, my, my other question about this, um, about this configuration that UNESCO uses in this classification system is, is really to what extent can we claim authority? To what extent can humans claim authority over things that have spent hundreds of years in their present environment? So if we were to take just one sort of semi-random example of, of the Mary Rose, the famous uh, Tudor warship um, and uh, that's, uh, that's now a major museum site, a major tourist attraction in Portsmouth on the south coast of England. That ship was built in a year or two. It sailed for 30 something years but it spent over 400 years um, underwater, um, you know, feeding things and, and, you know, sort of becoming a part of this new environment um, before archeological intervention um, raised each of the timbers and all of the artifacts um, and, um, you know, cleaned them up and, and put them in this sort of utopian space of the museum. And yet this kind of like authoritarian reach of the human is awfully selective and it seems to be pretty exclusive to wreckages of a certain type that are of a specific sort of cultural interest. And so we're not so archaeologists are not so much interested in, say, you know, migrant boats that capsize. Uh, we're not interested in, in cruise ships that wreck um, or oil tankers or things like this that are um, that are uh, considered contemporary uh, wreck sites. Um, and there's a lot more to say about that as well. Um, but what I would like to sort of focus on here that's sort of um, that, that is closely related to these concerns is the idea that um, that UNESCO and, and other sort of governing bodies of heritage often refer to these sites as resources. And I think this is um, a, a problem because when we think about how we view natural resources, for instance, a natural resource is something to be exploited. It's something from which we can extract something to commodify. Um, you know, uh, forest, mines, all of these things are considered natural resources. We might, we might also think of labor resources. Um, and so too it is with, uh, with cultural uh, resources or with heritage resources. They become a commodity. And, uh, there's a lot of money to be to be made and power to be had by controlling these uh, these alleged resources, despite um, you know the, the autonomy that they may have acquired over the course of you know hundreds of years of being isolated from human intervention. I might also um, uh, you know kind of uh, say that the, the word resources. If you actually look at the etymology of the word, you see that it's actually from the French resurgere, or sorry, the Latin resurgere, and um, which just means to raise up. It actually shares an etymology with, with resurrect. Um, however, we're not talking about uh, raising up from the dead necessarily, but raising up to the level of human utility. And uh, in, in, of course, in a, in a capitalist um, system, that level of human utility really just refers to um, a commodity. So there's a very famous um, maritime archeologist named uh, Keith McElroy who wrote famously in 1978 uh, in his book, um, Maritime Archaeology, that shipwrecks are the static seabed remains of a once dynamic machine. Um, and even this, this, this uh, line is, is still quoted quite a lot in maritime, in maritime archaeology literature, in the scientific literature. However, I think even as we've, we've just already seen in this very brief overview, um, we can see that, that that's not really true, um, that non-human architects show us that shipwrecks are still very dynamic, that they're not just passively awaiting archaeological intervention on the seafloor. Um, and each site, each dynamic autonomous machine really kind of works for or against, um, you know, Earth's 4.5 billion year project of, of increasing diversity um, here. So, um, you know, and so in this respect, we have to think of each of the, each site or each, each machine as being very different, that some, especially the organic ones, are quickly colonized, quickly eaten, they're really very rapidly absorbed into the, into the marine world, into the underwater environment. But others are horrific polluters, as you can see with, um, with this example of the, uh, some of the wreckage, um, the detritus from the Costa Concordia, uh, the wrecked um, cruise ship 
off the coast of, of Tuscany um, just a couple of years ago. Um, and this was before it was, it was the entire vessel was raised and it was recycled or parbuckled um, into, into new metallic things. But it left behind this, in, this debris field of all of the things that you would expect with middle class, uh, you know, in a middle class lifestyle. Uh, chairs and cushions and all of these things that are very slowly breaking down and that have actually even in, in the in the two or three years that it took the, um, uh, the the ship to be raised just in that time the plastics had brittled off so much that they are already um, in, in the food chain of the uh, the benthic animals living in this area and so it seems to me that in many cases the wrecks that are in most urgent need of cultural intervention are the ones that are left to natural forces. And I think this is again, you know, an example of, of the problem of, uh, of extra having extracted ourselves from, um, you know, from our environment and trying to say that we are somehow different or above. And so I would like to, you know, this is, I, I guess I'm, I'm making a sort of normative uh, claim here that, that given archeological expertise in studying the collapse of civilizations and in studying um, extinction patterns, and the causes and, and effects of all of these things, that archaeological intervention might begin to prioritize the polluters rather than the um, oceanic refuges that so often are the ones that actually get our attention, as you can see in this wooden cog that, um, that was raised up from the Netherlands. So in conclusion, what I mean by naufragic architecture and why, why this, this term appeals to me is that it, it acknowledges the fragility of the now. It acknowledges the fragility and the, and the finitude of the ship and that it was that way all along, that it was destined to fail. And this is kind of reminiscent of um, Steve Mentz's favorite term for the Anthropocene, the naufragocene, the epoch of the shipwreck. And, um, you know, this is particularly interesting, I think, if we can take seriously, uh, and, and I think we should, um, Lewis and Maslin's argument that 1610 is when the Anthropocene really begins with this, uh, this dip in CO2 levels due to the, uh, you know, the genocides um, and particularly the, uh, you know, the uh, depopulation of the Americas due to the combined forces of, of genocide and, and uh, European pathogens for which the indigenous people had no defenses. And so we see this drop in, in CO2 levels at that time that leaves a permanent geological impact. Um, also at this time of 1610, this is of course the time of European expansion. And so therefore we see this rapid, avid increase in shipbuilding and also an increase in ship wrecking. And so again, I think it's important to think about these shipwreck sites and we think about the, the way that ship construction has changed over time and particularly over these last 400 years, um, not, as, not as resources, but rather as sources because a resource claims to elevate, to raise up, but instead it really only reduces to one function, one single function for humankind rather than the multiplicity of functions that a term like source um, would connote. And so in, I, I suggest that we see shipwreck sites as, as sources of possibly contamination, but also possibly of biodiversity, of nutrients, and also potentially knowledge, and so much more. And I think making this conceptual shift would actually help us to prioritize the broken vessels that are, that are breaking um, irreparable oceanic ecosystems. And that maybe we might leave alone those broken vessels that aren't doing that and let failure reach its productive potentials. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Sarah. Next, we have Margaret Scotty, who is a professor at the Department of History at York University, so just up the street from us here. She will be presenting Water versus Wood, Desalination Machines on the Shipboard Space, circa 1695. All right. Well, first, my thanks to Christy and Jason and to the other presenters for such stimulating papers. So I'd like to take us back to the 17th century again and back to the Netherlands. 
on a day devoted to wooden, steel, and fiberglass structures de designed to, to traverse open oceans, I have promised you a story of water versus wood, specifically wooden barrels full of potable desalinated water. Humble but essential drinking water. The relationship between water and wood is often oppositional, something I realize all too glaringly uh, here in Toronto as I deal with a leaky roof brought on by melting snow and ice damming. But the case I want to lay out for you today, wood not only contained and transported water, but was also key to the production process. And in the end, this is where it gets interesting, wood and the labor around it also seems to be what caused the undoing of a cost-efficient, even life-saving new technology, a sea machine for converting seawater into fresh. How did early modern European merchants who sailed from continent to continent in the 16th through 18th centuries handle the problem of drinking water? At the end of the 17th century, Dutch East India Company or VOC ships which could be upwards of a thousand tons, were embarking on voyages that would last two years on average, carrying more than 200 men, closer to 300 if you include soldiers and passengers along with the crew. These were risky voyages for many reasons. And what was the primary cause of death? Not threats from pirates or encounters with maritime rivals. The main cause of death was disease, Mariners died of outbreaks of anything from dysentery to scurvy, diseases caused by diet or transmitted by water. Consequently, the powers that be paid a lot of attention to provisions and sufficient fresh water. And as a result, merchant ships needed to store a lot of water. The standard way to equip a vessel was to fill huge barrels with enough fresh water to last the voyage before the ship left its home port. The general calculation was between 1.2 and 1.5 liters per person per day. This meant somewhere around 130,000 liters of water for the nine month voyage from the Netherlands to Batavia. That would mean dozens or even hundreds of these huge barrels shown here. Uh, these in the front would hold nearly 500 liters each, uh, and there were yet larger ones which would hold nearly a thousand liters. Here is a modern reconstruction of a 16th century Portuguese merchant vessel uh, to show how it might have been laded, uh, and the archaeologist here estimated 2.7 liters per person, so somewhat more uh, than the Dutch average. Uh, and in these barrels, other uh, victuals and trade goods would also be stored, uh, but it still gives you a sense of how much of the ship's cargo needed to be devoted to water. Here is a Dutch diagram. Uh, this is of a warship, so it would not have needed as many trade goods. And if we zoom in, uh, you can see the large hold aft of the vessel. Uh, and that has this section here designated just for water. Now, the ship's cook also required an additional amount of fresh water for preparing meals. Uh, and here, uh, further four in the ship is the ship's kitchen. Uh, and below that, uh, the furnace or oven uh, below. And this was conveniently located near the food stores. So in practice, the water in all of these barrels did not stay fresh for long. So captains aim to stop quite often, every few weeks if possible, to resupply. Drinking foul water could cause outbreaks of disease. Uh, inspired by the thriving market for distilled tonics and spirits, people experimented with flavoring water with various additives from herbs and charcoal to lime and lead. But these could often exacerbate medical problems. Because of foul water's unpleasant flavor and sliminess, sailors often preferred to drink ale, but that too only stayed fresh for a limited time. The issue of drinking water was clearly a non-trivial one 
Therefore, it should not surprise us that the innovative entrepreneurial folks who lived in various ports worked hard to solve this problem. I'd like to introduce you now to one particular instrument devised by the Amsterdam-based Swedish merchant Christian Nenfeig in 1690. Nenfeig's device, which he called his Vatavetic, a waterwork, is compelling for a number of reasons. This machine, which offered clear financial and medical advantages, predates the invention of a similar device by the British by 70 years. And then between 1690 and 1707, more than 150 Dutch East India Company vessels were outfitted with the Menfig's water distilling machine and sailed with the specialized personnel trained to run it. The waterwork operators were expected to keep meticulous records of their day's work. I have analyzed, analyzed these more extensively elsewhere. Uh, these records can shed light on bureaucracy, the tracking of information, and individual literacy and numeracy on board these merchant vessels. But what is most surprising about this waterwork device was that despite its clear success, within 15 years, it was ignominiously rejected by the men it was supposed to help, the sailors. We cannot know exactly why the sailors ultimately scuttled this technology. But in my brief time today, I want us to think about how this instrument might have disrupted standard daily ship board practices. By studying the various reasons that men at sea opposed the water work, we can gain greater insights into the function of the ship's regulations and structures. Now, no diagram survives of Nenfig's machine, but we know that it comprised a large copper kettle with a large globe affixed above the kettle, which served as a cooling chamber. That was doused with seawater to condense the sweet water inside and to begin to preheat the next quantity of water to be boiled. Now we can see here a French example from 75 years later uh, that is similar. Nenfig's apparatus was integrated with the fire in the galley, a strategy designed to save fuel. The machine had to run at least six hours a day and often longer to produce sufficient fresh water. The VOC did not immediately adopt the device. Instead, after some promising preliminary results, it agreed to a series of trial runs. Nenfig was appointed as instructor and supervisor for the installation of the Waterwerk. Here you can see the eight page instruction booklet he produced for the machine operators. Now the device was tricky enough that the crew was encouraged to practice operating the machine on land in a special facility before they embarked. Over the next two years, the water makers dutifully completed their daily records on pre-printed forms. Some of those are gathered here in this 1100-page uh, collection, which contains 18 voyages uh, to Asia. And the water ma makers turned in their paperwork when they reached the Cape of Good Hope. Um, at that point, the reports were sent back to Amsterdam and two directors of the Amsterdam Chamber poured over the forms. Uh, they produced a comprehensive summary of death and disease statistics. From the three years of voyages, they found that the boats equipped with waterwork devices suffered significantly fewer health issues, uh, a 9.2% mortality rate instead of 13.3. This essentially worked out to seven fewer people dying on each voyage. This reduction in death of skilled labor translated into not inconsequential financial benefits, which thus outweighed the cost of the expensive copper machines, which were valued at 300 guilders each, uh, to say nothing of the costs of paying their operators. This led the Amsterdam Chamber to order that the system should be used on all their ships. From then on, two full-time water makers were assigned to operate the machine on each boat. These men were exempted from guard duty and all other chores to allow them to concentrate on the job at hand. However, as we will see, there were lots of criticisms from the men on board. Nenfig and his supporters, including his son, attempted to respond to the critics of the machine. However, in 1703, Nenfig Sr. died, as did the report authors the following year, and almost immediately thereafter, the company stopped using the distillation device. 
So what were the sailors' complaints? Why, after more than a dozen years, was this revolutionary technology viewed as optional or worse, oppressive? First, a lot of men disliked the coppery tastes of the distilled water. One water maker noted that the distilled water was good for cooking, but I would not give it to animals. It always has an oily taste. Therefore, in my opinion, the water is not good. Secondly, obtaining a steady wood supply was a persistent problem. The records show that some water makers might burn uh, 12 or 20 logs a day, where others routinely needed as many as 48. Many must have shared the cook's fire for at least some of the operating hours. They would also have burned any scraps from the ship's carpenters and coopers. But still, the operators needed to spend a substantial amount of their time on shore scrounging for wood, something that could be a serious problem given the meager firewood resources at the, at the Cape. One watermaker kept careful notes of the different types of extra sticks he collected when his vessel stopped on the coast of present day Gabon. Uh, he identified those as thick, round, or very small. Well, it didn't taste good, it caused extra work, and some crew also raised concerns about increased fire risk. However, I haven't found incidents of such problems in the records. The key issues seem to have been social and spatial. Changes in the traditional operating practices gave rise to what Dutch scholar Johan de Jong characterized as tensions between captains, crew members, and machines. Could it be that these tensions were caused by the extra space that the machine took up? You are likely all familiar with the famous mutiny on the bounty, which occurred in 1789, when Fletcher Christian led a group of men to rebel against their captain, William Bly. The late Australian historian, Greg Denning, suggests that tensions rose to an unbearable height because the standard use of shipboard space was disrupted by a particularly finicky cargo, breadfruit plants, shown here. The fact that the crew had to cede part of their space on deck to the plants led to increased conflict and soon mutiny. Did the waterwork devices cause something similar? Well, it is possible, I doubt it, we do not see reports of unusual unrest or disciplinary actions on these voyages. But it is plausible that the additional physical pressure of the supply of firewood could have had financial implications. De Jong suggests that additional supplies of wood on the homeward voyage would have reduced the space available for private trade goods that might otherwise have been stored in those same areas. Despite the VOC's official stance against private trade, which was much stricter than the British East India companies, there is evidence that men returning from Batavia resented this incursion into their bottom line. Here we can see the very strict list of what size luggage the employees were allowed, and the measurements of the trunks uh, are all noted here and on the following two pages of this pamphlet. Here we can see modern reproductions of VOC chests of various sizes. So the question remains, were the stores of firewood somehow getting in the way of these trunks? Perhaps the new device caused a labor imbalance. The supervising water maker was paid a wage of 18 guilders, which was comparable to the sail master, cooper, and under surgeon, and his assistant earned 12 guilders. Did other crew feel like that was too much? considering that the water makers were relieved of guard duties and chores. Perhaps the water makers themselves felt underpaid. In the 15 years the machines were in use, there are no records of the water makers repeating the post on subsequent journeys, despite now being familiar with the machine and its extra wages. Or perhaps conflicts arose from having to share tight hot quarters with the cook. It may well have been a combination of all of these factors hot, constant, tedious work with seemingly little pay, just the complaints of one's fellow crew, no extra perks to line one's pockets after a lengthy journey, just increased run-ins with the elements and hours long record-keeping duties. It is worth noting 
On the other side of the channel, James Lind, who famously identified citrus fruit as an antidote to scurvy, devised a similar desalinating device in the 1760s. However, even with his medical reputation, distillation did not take off on board until the age of steam, more than a century and a half after Nenfig's innovation. In the 1850s, Thomas Tassel Grant, an inventor who became controller of Vitaling and a fellow of the Royal Society, adapted the distillation kettle to make use of excess steam from the steam engines, which would have been coal powered at that time. Here is a Dutch interpretation of a Grant distiller. Only in the later 19th century, therefore, did ships begin to produce regular amounts of potable water on board. This leads me to suggest that it was not a question of the fitness of the machine, but of the broader logistics of the fuel supply. Since the reception of Nentvig's body work is so hazy, it is difficult to come to firm conclusions about the trajectory of this effective, but ultimately unsuccessful sea machine. Even though the authorities on shore felt that this device had measurable benefits, the end users, those who had to drink the water on board, could not overcome their distaste. But was it only distaste or also distrust? Distrust of this destabilizing machine and its operators, men whose manual labor of collecting wood was perplexingly viewed as special or elite, demanding enough that they could be exempted from other manual labor that every other mariner had to do. In an extremely hierarchical environment, this divergence may have seemed too much to tolerate. With the watermaker's irregular labor conditions came physical disruption aboard ship, piles of logs, essential but holding no long-term value, displacing the trade goods that could have potentially made the other men wealthy. Wood was not the right tool for producing water. I see this anecdote in the history of maritime technology as a cautionary one. Despite there being a clear need and an effective new device, there may still be numerous objections to surmount for it to be accepted. But historians may never be able to definitively assess the ultimate cause of failure. In spite of mountains of documentary evidence for and by users, the history of certain sea machines must remain blank. Thank you. Thank you very much, Margaret. That was wonderful. Uh, our next speaker is Larry Ferrero, who is a professor in the Department of History and Art History at George Mason University. He will be presenting the evolution of the naval architect, 1600 to 2000. Hello, I just want to make sure that my, um, my slides are uh, up and visible. Should I go to presentation mode? Please, yeah. So I'm Larry Ferrero. Um, I'm a naval architect by profession, historian, and uh, <clears throat> I'm going to be talking about how the term naval architecture and the naval architect um, evolved over four centuries. Um, the left-hand side is, a, um, is the uh, department symbol, branch symbol, that we developed some years ago when I was uh, in the Navy. Uh, that's our, our, uh, uh, our conception of uh, our role in designing the ship. And you can see that naval architects do not hide their light under a barrel. Some of you may recognize the figure from William Blake as adapted by uh, the, the Art Deco um, sculptures of the Rockefeller Center. And underneath the dividers is a destroyer that. Um, uh, is currently um, in use around the world. Um, I got interested in the subject when I was told about this conference, uh, because actually the reason I'm not um, able to be here most of the day is I'm teaching a class called Systems Engineering and Systems Architecture. And the, uh, the comparison between an engineer and an architect um, in systems um, has many roots that uh, go back to uh, this question, why isn't a naval architect called a naval engineer? And the, uh, the history of both terms actually evolved in parallel uh, 
Um, eventually, uh, there were places where they converged, but they still tend to be somewhat um, uh, separate. Typically, uh, today, we think about naval architects as engineers, uh, right alongside civil engineers and mechanical engineers. But they use the word engineer, we use architect, and we don't always see our profession as having anything comparable to those who design um, the, uh, the homes or uh, auditoriums or cathedrals, when in fact, many of the roots come from the same place. So we're going to talk about why uh, that is the case. Now, I just said naval architects don't hide their lights under a bushel, and I certainly don't. Um, my two books here are Ships and Science and Bridging the Seas. They are the history of the profession of naval architecture from the birth of the scientific revolution all the way to um, the information age. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, it's a trip that uh, is uh, absolutely fascinating and absolutely unexpected. But uh, what I'm trying, what I try to do in both books is uh, understand why uh, the science of naval architecture arose in the first place because we were building ships uh, very nicely without having to resort to anything that looked like engineering for many hundreds, if not thousands of years. Today, we think about naval architects as engineers whose primary job is to um, use scientific theory, engineering principles, to predict what the ship's going to be before it's built. And that's what an engineer does. You hire an engineer to design and build a bridge, a cathedral, uh, a skyscraper, so that you know that it's going to stand, it won't fall down, it will resist wind loads. That's modern, that's not, what thing, that's not how it began. So let's first talk about what is an engineer. Now that word has uh, a particularly interesting uh, history. It goes back further than the 1600s, but for our purposes, uh, we can start with Hamlet and how Shakespeare defined engineers. It was somebody who handled bombs and mines. That's the uh, line from Hamlet uh, to sport to have an engineer hoist by his own petard. A petard is a type of explosive. <coughs> that military connotation continued. Um, the engineers of the time of Vauban in France, for example, um, were concerned with building military fortifications with building um, military um, structures, eventually became uh, wider. And uh, you had the schools of engineering, civil engineering, which uh, were for roads and bridges. In fact, th that's the name of the school in France, uh, the, the School of Roads and Bridges. It wasn't until the 1800s that the idea that an engineer was a profession on par with uh, lawyers and doctors and clergy started to come into um, public consciousness. Uh, at the time, you still did not have degree fields in those. In fact, anybody who took um, engineering typically was looking at uh, um, taking a degree in, in natural philosophy. But um, the profession of civil engineers uh, started to develop their own institutional bodies the way um, doctors and lawyers had. The first one was the Institution of Civil Engineers in 1818. And then graduate, gradually you saw mechanical and other engineers not only develop their own professional bodies, but also introduce curricula into universities, which became more and more diverse. Until today, from the uh, uh, 20th century to the 21st century, we now have, <coughs> excuse me, um, not just um, civil and mechanical, we have systems engineers, we have uh, biomedical engineers, uh, it's become more and more um, subdivided. Today, we commonly accept the idea that engineers uh, ex uh, uh, examine problems using a uh, scientific method and uh, analyze problems uh, with the goal of predicting the uh, outcome of uh, the system, meaning what the system will do. But naval architects weren't called engineers. They were called builders. Um, the original term from uh, the Greek, and I will not get the proper Greek pronunciation, um, but you can read it there, is uh, translated to 
ship carpenter. Um, in Britain and in France, it was a carpenter, a charpentier, shipwright. Um, you, you saw the equivalent in somebody who was working in wood, a woodwright who might be building furniture or might be building buildings. And that's as early as the 1200s. It wasn't until the 1700s that you started to see the word constructor in these two languages um, start to denote the people in charge of designing and building ships. And the word um, uh, uh, was not that dissimilar in other European languages. Um, ship's constructor in Danish, um, ship builder in Dutch, and proti is a particularly Venetian form of Italian. So the term evolved and did not mean engineering. It primarily um, had to do with things like, uh, <coughs> excuse me, it primarily had to do with things like building the structure, building the pieces, uh, uh, fitting the rudders, but it didn't encompass what we would call today the architecture. That evolved um, really from the first ideas of architecture, which most people are pretty familiar with um, as uh, Vitruvius's work, which was rediscovered in the early part of the, um, uh, the 1400s and eventually printed um, by the 1500s. So you started to see the word architect come into common usage to denote not a builder, like a builder of a building, but somebody whose primary purpose is to uh, uh, examine the, the overall concept and elements that go into the building, not simply to put it together, but to form a creative whole. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't that long. If you think about the word architect coming into use, call it 1580, <coughs> excuse me, still getting over a cough after uh, having the flu over a month ago. Um, you, did, you, you didn't have to wait that long, maybe a generation to see the word come into use in Portugal and Germany as part of naval architecture. The first uh, time it was used was in Portuguese, first book of naval architecture. And then Joseph Furtenbach, whose um, work is reproduced here on the right, um, six books of architecture of which the second volume, interestingly enough, was naval architecture. And their idea was naval architecture is about architecture of the sea. It was really about um, the, the overall uh, ship as a concept, but it was also about um, the decorations and the form. So the words started to come into common use about the same time as the word architect came to replace the word builder for somebody who constructed buildings. And it continued to evolve. If that was the view in the 1600s, by the 1700s, geometry had come to the fore because mathematics and geometry was now part of the scientific revolution. It was the way we spoke to each other. It was the way, frankly, that the people in power who were um, typically classically trained and they knew, who, they knew who Euclid was, but they certainly didn't live in the dockyards. So if you wanted to talk to the people in um, London or in uh, Versailles or in any of the places of power about your ship, you couldn't talk about building a piece of wood. They wouldn't understand that. You had to speak to them in the terms they understood and they understood geometry. So that's how naval architecture started to change from uh, simply wood building, woodworking to a geometric application to ships. And you have here three treatises, um, more or less around the same time, French, Henry uh, du Hamel du Monceau, uh, uh, Chapman's famous uh, treatise of shipbuilding and uh, Ville du Clairbois's um, geometric um, essay on naval architecture. And of the three, most people think about um, um, uh, Chapman as you know, the, the emblematic naval architect because he had beautiful drawings. You can't, you can't do what he did even on a computer today. It's just gorgeous. And this really captured people's attention and it certainly um, was what enabled him to attain a uh, rank of great privilege and great power within the Swedish Navy. 
the ability to translate what was happening in the shipyard into a, a recognizable form that somebody who was classically trained could understand. Now, we evolved as the industrial revolution evolved. So we went away from just simple representations of geometry to something that had the um, engineering, um, which of course was becoming most important background to it. We were building in steam, we were building in iron. We needed to understand how it worked and be able to predict what it did because it did not follow the same path that wood chips did. For thousands of years, we had sail. Now we've got steam and, and paddle wheels and propellers. So we have to have something to predict how it's going to perform. Thousands of years, we had wood. Now we've got iron, then steel. We have to treat it differently. And that's what was happening on land. <clears throat> a more um, uh, uh, scientific approach. We wanted to have standardized products. So we were starting to hire engineers. If we were in the brewing industry and you were trying to create standardized beer, you didn't hire a brewmaster, you hired a chemist because chemists could tell you what was going on underneath the hood and get you a common consistent product out of your brew cycle. That's why these big breweries were hiring chemists at the same time that shipbuilders were hiring people who'd been trained as engineers. And engineers didn't simply draw the ships, they also calculated what the load was. This is the classic uh, balance a ship on a wave and then determine what the um, uh, wave loads. And then this is the bending moment. And I cannot tell you how many hours I have spent doing this by hand um, to tell you, yep, the ship is strong, the ship is safe, it will go to sea. Now, the business of naval architecture also had to change um, the way, in terms of the way its profession was represented to the public. Here's three views of the same person, John W. Griffiths, a naval architect in New York City. Um, he called himself a ship's carpenter in 1838. He called himself an architect in 1850. And it was only in 1870, about the same time that engineers started to make a uh, foray, that the word naval architect started to come into common parlance. Now, this is also partly the fault of business records and census, which did not always have categories that um, were easily translatable, but you can see that the term evolved during the 19th century to what we call today a naval architect. The naval architect in the 20th century um, lived first in a dra drafting room. That's the uh, uh, Harland and Wolf drafting room that you see on the left, um, which I grew up in, um, hunched over a table with um, uh, uh, compasses and templates and 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 uh, other utensils to these giant workstations. And that's, by the way, that little box that you see down here is a three and a half inch floppy disk reader. But these giant workstations would probably have the computing power of your um, watch font. Well, it's 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 not nearly as powerful as as your your home as your as your phone um, were the way we uh, did things 1980s, 1990s. Things changed dramatically with the computer revolution and the I'm internet. Not, I'm just listening. Was that a question? Um, so the naval architect in the 21st century looks a lot like the engineer of the 21st century. They're living and working everywhere. They're the, the, um, the tools that we use for designing ships, the computer aided design run on your laptop or they run on a server that you can access anywhere. We use 3D solid modeling, just like any other um, engineer. We use computational, computational fluid dynamics, CFD at the bottom, which we often call color for dollars. So the tools of the naval architect have evolved from that um, old conception of somebody who's um, uh, starting with just the form to geometry, and now we're integrated with other types of engineering and we work in many other fields than just ships. Don't just think ships. We are working on offshore wind farms. We are working on ocean energy conversion. Um, projects that require naval architects for um, ocean trash collection. Um, if you are a spacecraft and you land in the water, you've got to float. 
and you've got to be stable. That's a naval architect. Um, for those of you who um, really enjoyed the uh, seasons four and five of Money Heist on Netflix, Casa de Papel, uh, the consultant who um, came up with the whole, um, uh, how do you get into a flooded vault and how do you pump out the gold from a, a flooded vault was a naval architect. So we get to consult for hit TV series. And of course, maritime archeology span um, is becoming of great interest, certainly for this group. But um, in order to understand what was going on, we uh, uh, turned to the naval architects to help us interpret these wrecks. And that's my pitch. Should I stop sharing? Thanks, Larry. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we have time for, thank you very much to our three speakers. We have time for a few um, questions. I'll remind everyone, please type questions into the Q&A. Um, there's one, I'll start with one um, question which came in, uh, I think specifically directed towards um, Sarah, but you know, please anyone answer. Um, the comment is the presentation about shipwrecks curiously ties into the transition from viewing oceans as living inhabitable, inhabitable bodies to seeing them as empty foreign ones, um, which also came up in the first um, panel this morning especially when it comes to the disinterest in particular shipwrecks. Sarah, I don't know if you want to tackle. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, that was actually um, something that I wrote down with uh, Carola's talk this morning. Now she said that um, sea territories became written into a state of blankness when she was talking about map making and how um, you know, the sort of early modern maps, you know, were showed oceans as being vivid and sort of, you know, these lively places that were teeming with all, you know, all kinds of, you know, wondrous organisms. Um, but then over time, we start see, seeing that shift toward the the, uh, the oceans as being this just sort of this blank blue, just this, this no man's zone. Um, and indeed, in a way, you know, in, in some ways, it is a sort of no man's zone, um, or no man's land. But, um, it doesn't, that blankness doesn't reflect, um, you know, it's just the, uh, again, you know, the, the liveliness of ocean. So I, I kind of perked up at that point in, in uh, Corolla's talk as well. And I think that um, it kind of speaks to some things that, uh, you know, that I've been thinking about lately in regards to this idea that we have of the ocean as being a sort of, as being an infinite space. Um, and I think I, if I remember correctly, uh, Jason mentioned something earlier this morning too about um, about water being sort of you know physically and necessarily difficult to contain. Um, and this and I and I you know worry that that because of the way that the the human imaginary has long constructed oceans um, as being this kind of you know this, this place of of oblivion and um, of the infinite and the sublime. That we can that we forget, um, you know, that that's actually not the case. It's very poetic and it's very beautiful, but um, you know, but in reality, the, you know, our our oceans and the and the, the things living in them, um, what all that they contain, uh, you know, that this is it is finite and it is fragile. Thank you. Um, we I'll I'll stay with the questions that are. Um, in the chat, and then I have, I have a few to ask add in myself. Um, there is a, qu a question comment um, with respect to the distinction between engineer and architect, arguably a blurred distinction in my own David Lee Bourbon's practice. I quote the late Peter Rice in the engineer imagines, quote, I would distinguish the difference between the engineer and the architect mm -hmm. by saying the architect's response is primarily creative, whereas the engineer's is essentially inventive, end quote. And David says, I will follow this with broader based question um, addressing the full day's proceedings. So whoever, obviously to Larry or Margaret, um, I'm happy for, Mar I'm sorry, but I haven't been introduced to Margaret, but I'm happy to have Margaret uh, kick off because of course I wasn't uh, 
you know, in the, the early part to, to hear some of the conversations. Well, uh, I actually, my talk wasn't so much on engineers, um, but I would say just Larry about your examples. Um, don't you see the example of, of geometrization of uh, architects as just trying to raise their own status, right? That kind of concern in the early modern era that if you could say something with math, you would get more respect. And so I thought maybe that was the impetus for the books to become more and more geometrized. The um, uh, I I would I'm I'm rephrasing the way you're you're putting the um, the statement. They had to get noticed. Uh, sorry, they had to communicate with people who had the political authority and of course the money. And in order to do that, they had to speak the language of those um, administrators. You know, keep in mind that we're we're looking now in, in the 1600s and 1700s. So we're we've gone away from these um, monarchs who you know have essentially uh, just run a country. Uh, not, I don't want to say haphazardly, but certainly without the the bureaucracy that came um, with the uh, more modern nation state. Those bureaucrats, and that's not a bad term. Um, you know, they work in a bureau were trained, as I said, classically. They have read the, um, the great works. They, they could speak mathematics. They could speak um, about those sorts of things. And in order for an engineer or an architect or anyone to be able to communicate um, in, in that era his ideas, they had to be able to speak the language and that language was geometry. So it wasn't a question of, I, I want to raise my social status. It was, how do I make certain that um, uh, number one, I'm communicating with you. And by the way, it wasn't a one directional. The people in power in Versailles, in London, in um, Madrid, also wanted to be able to talk to the people in the shipyards who lived and worked and breathed um, wood and wood dust. And so what they were asking for was um, information, not just on what kind of wood you're using, but um, can you describe to me what you're building? Um, actually, I'm spending all this money. Can you prove to me that the ship that you build is going to actually float and not sink? So there was a lot of money, and this is the subject of my books, Ships and Science and then Bridging the Seas, devoted to understanding the science of ships, not just ships. I'm, I'm using ships, but this is happening everywhere, um, so that it became more understandable for the people who were um, making these decisions. So it was a two-way street. It wasn't um, engineers trying to jump themselves up from uh, a low social standing. It was a, um, a, a back and forth communication that um, required, quite frankly, the naval architects to come out of their shipyards to Versailles and not vice versa. So um, that's why the process of geometrization happened. Um, I want to quickly answer the question of architect and engineer. And the truth is, I see very little difference in the actual day-to-day -day working of engineers and architects. Um, engineers are absolutely creative. It's hard to look at um, what comes out of um, Ford or Tesla and not look at what these engineers were doing and saying, oh, that's not creative. Or look at the, um, the bridges that um, have, are, are being built, um, these wonderful cable stay bridges across the, um, I can't remember the valley in, um, in France. Uh, it, the bridge is something like five kilometers long and it's gorgeous. I mean, it's hard to say that engineer was not creating something. Now I'm doing my best not to be too self aggrandizing. When we design a ship, damn it, we're creative. We are creating something that will float, that will move, that will fight, that will give a, make a presence known. And we are absolutely as creative as anyone who's painting a canvas. So there's me as an engineer and me as a naval architect saying, I don't see a lot of white space between them. 
feel like I want, I want to hear Meredith or Jillian address the questions of 17th and early 18th century France. But I, but I don't want to put you on the spot, though. Oops, I think Meredith's on. Jillian, you you mean the, the current questions in the Q&A? No, 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 just about, about this um, sort of, I mean, I, and I will sort of frame it as a larger question as well. I mean, one of the things that I thought was really interesting coming out of this session was where was knowledge located? Like who had expertise and knowledge? Where, and some of it is clearly about presenting, making that public, communicating that in whatever ways through manuscripts. But clearly there's a whole range of expertise, which we one of the things that's come out all day about that um, ships and ship design and being on the sea required. And some of that happened before the ship ever sailed. And some of that clearly was on the ship through time as the ship um, operated as the ship was on the sea. And it just seems to me that one of the things that has been explored in various ways by people is that um, people today is, is how, where that knowledge was located and the different sort of rise and fall of the positions of those people at different times based on particular circumstance. And you two were talking about one particular issue in France that seems very relevant here. Margaret was talking about this one technology and machinery that was operating within the ship. So it, it seems to me that some of these issues that are very, that, that Larry's discussed in a very particular way about the engineer versus architect, uh, really raise much bigger issues about expertise and knowledge. So that's why I, I didn't need to put you on the spot or Margaret can jump in with that. And of course, I should add that Sarah is also saying happens even after the ship is no longer on the surface of the water. So it that has a very long life cycle that one could explore. Well, I mean, it seems to me that the, the point that Margaret just raised um, is, is one that Meredith and I also raise in our book, which is that, you know, I don't think you can just uh, study uh, knowledge in a vacuum without a social context. And so, uh, you know, part of what we've observed in the context of understanding how galleys get built and who took credit for building them had to do with the desire for the, um, for the shipbuilders and carpenters to hold on to that knowledge um, and, and, and not necessarily uh, share it in, you know, with the lar larger public, at least uh, initially. But also to try to use, um, what, you know, to think about what kind of labor uh, they were using uh, to to do it, and so um, there was a lot of pushback, um, you know, in Marseille, for example, to the practice of using enslaved labor to do the kinds of things that corporate bodies were used to doing. Things like training enslaved Turks to to be cockers, uh, for example, uh, raised a lot of protests. So I think there's a dynamic that Margaret also highlighted of having to think not only about you know what could be done, but how the people who are actually involved in either sailing the ship or building it are going to respond to those kinds of uh, innovations. I actually just wanted to, to briefly add, I, I too was going to um, highlight Margaret's talk and I also this fascinating description of her current project, the development of, I'm looking at the chat, development of skilled labor on French East India Company vessels in the Indian Ocean. And so to kind of add to what Jillian said, I wonder if you have any comments um, about that, Margaret, and also particularly in terms of the kind of as you know, these, these ships move into literally international waters, but does this knowledge become kind of globalized in a sense, sort of what's, the, you know, what's the, the impact um, of that in terms of expertise, knowledge, skilled labor, or so on? Thanks. Um, it's so exciting to be in a room with other people who do 18th century French navigation. Um, it's really great. Uh, my Indian Ocean uh, project is pretty early and it's really based on a really rich set of French sources, which, um, caught my eye because of the large amount of math uh, that was done on board ship, um, all the sort of 
the pilot's mate was uh, practicing his geometry uh, and turning it into the lieutenant. And uh, so there's a whole kind of shipboard math math mathematical uh, school happening. Uh, but the records for those voyages also um, indicate um, Lascars who were on board. And so I'm really going to be uh, drilling further into who did what labor at what point in the voyage, uh, because certainly a crew that started from Europe and went uh, to the Mascarenes and then on to Pondicherry uh, had a really different set of people on board in the um, middle leg of that voyage. They would spend months uh, reprovisioning, but also just waiting out the monsoons uh, on the islands. And so at some point, these long distance voyages are actually shorter island to island voyages and uh, become sort of transporting local labor, uh, not just international. So I'm sort of calling for us to think about all of these ship voyages um, as multi-part because we the truism that, oh, these are such uh, international polyglot uh, communities. But I think the communities really changed over time. Uh, and I think it's exciting to see um, more about that. Um, Sarah, I had a question for you about um, wrecking and people who would go and salvage wrecks, you know, as soon as they happened in the 17th century or, you know, and to try and, and get as much of value off of a boat. And so that's kind of interesting. It raises the question of the boats that were easy to salvage got salvaged then and the ones that were difficult, uh, you know, have remained there for 400 years. But uh, I guess, um, I don't know, maybe that is a question of you take the valuable things when you could, uh, whereas for us now it is the, the fuel that's in the barrels that's you know, be going, be going to become toxic waste. Is that uh, not valuable enough to raise? Or you know, just questions of, um, I guess, the evolution of a wreck over the centuries. Um, and to instead of looking back at the 400 year old one as, as so interesting, uh, I think maybe back in the day, it was a similar kind of economic calculus. Um, anyways, I'd love to hear more from you. Yeah, thanks, Margaret. Um, yeah, and it's a, it's a great question, and it's really interesting. The, the um, example that came to mind when you mentioned that was um, uh, the Yarmouth Roads shipwreck, which is in the, the Solent. Um, it separates the uh, the Isle of Wight from the south coast of England, where I've, um, is, I've spent some time down there. <laughs> and, uh, um, that was one that, uh, that if the if the wreck is actually to uh, to be identified with the with the uh, historical records that um, you know that we have found that sort of date to around the same time and in the same place, then that is one that was uh, that was salvaged and there was definitely um, a lot of uh, a lot of you know politics around uh, you know around uh, the, the salvaging and you know this this kind of bizarre piracy and. Um, uh, and, and so you're right, you know, like the, the things that, that we value change over time. And so in that respect, these, these early attempts at salvaging shipwrecks where, where they were accessible, like this is a very shallow wreck and, you know, like 16, six meters of water or something like that. So of course it would have um, surpassed the surface for quite a while before it eventually just, you know, eroded away. Um, and so, you know, and then, you know, if we sort of fast forward to the 1980s and 1990s, when this wreck first started becoming excavated by archaeologists, um, then obviously the things that are valued are, are in some ways kind of similar to what was being salvaged, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, on the Isle of, uh, on the Isle of Wight, you know, hundreds of years before, um, except that at that point, we're not looking for things to resell as much as things to, um, you know, to, to extract knowledge from about the wreck, um, about who it was sailing under, you know, trying to um, attribute certain wrecks to certain nations or certain empires, certain flags, um, and of course certain certain sailors and ethnicities, uh, which is incredibly complicated and also uh, prone to to uh, deep inaccuracies. So um, you know, but again, these you know the, the artifacts oftentimes come up, and maybe a few select uh, of them you know are actually are actually able to produce knowledge. And um, you know maybe even a fewer amount than that go on display at a museum, but the rest are are sort of kept underneath in these you know, storage units and things like that, and never see the light of day again. So it almost you know begs the question of what's the point in bringing all these things up to begin with. 
And in land archaeology, there is a, a kind of, there has been for several years now a kind of pushback to this and saying, well, if we have so many examples, uh, you know, beyond representation of this particular type of thing, then we ought to just put the things back in the ground and cover them over. Um, so it, it would be it'll be interesting, I think, to see if maritime archaeology sort of um, you know starts to to do some of that um, as well. Um, and kind of you know engage in, in that in that practice of of um, of reburial. Um, and, and I think to your your question about you know how do we value you know these these more contemporary shipwrecks where you know they're you know they're either carrying or they're composed of uh, potentially hazardous materials. Um, this is you know this is really interesting because there's this arbitrary 100 year cutoff point, this threshold before which things become technically, according to UNESCO's um, categorization system, they become technically heritage uh, resources. Um, now, they have made an exception recently for World War II wrecks, which do not fall on the other side of that threshold, but are of cultural value. And so, it, again, it's this, this um, assignation of value that seems so arbitrary in so many cases. And I think that if we are to start, you know, we as a, as a, as a discipline are to start actually finding value in raising things like, uh, you know, like, uh, um, I, don't, I don't know, like, uh, you know, tanks of oil and things like this that are you know, potentially polluting, then we are going to have to start kind of rewriting our research questions and, and rethinking what it is that we as a discipline have to offer. Um, and to use the, uh, you know, Donna Haraway's famous term to stem the tide of ruination. What, what can we do to help with that? So, but it is a question of value, like you said. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask a question of Margaret. Um, Margaret, you mentioned um, looking through the uh, <clears throat> uh, records of uh, French ships in the uh, Indian Ocean going to Pondicherry, et cetera. Were these merchant vessels or were these naval? Merchant vessels. The Compagnie des Indes. Oh, okay. Yes. And they, they they had many, they operated in many ways similar to the French Navy. In fact, sometimes the officers were um, sort of borrowed one from the other. But I, I'd be interested to know how they um, kept their logs because my research into uh, French naval logs was um, uh, showed many officers kept each officer kept an individual log. They didn't always um, compare notes, um, which unfortunately meant that uh, when you're trying to track the course of the ship, one officer said X and the other officer said Y. But um, that uh, transfer of knowledge so that uh, everyone aboard of, of officer rank was um, being trained in, the, um, in navigation was quite different from what I saw in British ships where there was one official ship's log. And um, I saw no evidence, uh, unless I was just not looking properly, of you know, the day-to-day uh, -day transfer of knowledge among crew members. So I'd be interested to see if the Compagnie des End also carried out that, um, uh, that, that same um, practice. Uh, thanks. I've published a couple of articles on logbooks, one specifically on French logbook keeping, um, but the other more generally about the evolution. Uh, and I know that Pepys, uh, when he was in his role as the Secretary for the Navy, was really interested in keeping um, kind of a centralized um, library of ship's logs and distilling them. He had a scheme where he was going to try and right. uh, short, shorten them. I personally don't think anyone ever consulted those. Uh, libraries of logbooks that doesn't seem that they they did but uh yeah it's certainly you know an important part of uh their professionalization and uh, so many people in the french case would show up to be promoted without their logbook um and then they'd claim that they had hit uh rough weather or that pirates had stolen their logbooks and so then into the French log or into the French legislation, they entered uh, a new rule which said you could no longer throw your logbooks overboard. So I think that's a sign that people were coming in with uh, subpar logbooks. And for Gillian and Meredith, there was this sort of uh, 
uh, rivalry between the Atlantic and the Mediterranean captains. And you see these in these textbooks like, oh, you cannot train a Mediterranean sailor for the open ocean. You know, so I would be really interested to, I don't know whether we have records that would show that there were personal rivalries, you know, or what happened if someone did get a job who had Mediterranean background and then was able to transfer to the Atlantic. Um, so much of that is not in the in the archives, but and it was really fascinating. So thank you for going to bat for the for the med, but also really interesting that uh, it was treated in such a, an artistic and traditional way, and then that's not in the Atlantic uh, examples that I've seen. But anyways, thanks again. And I wanted to think, I was trying to connect my paper to uh, these works on, on cruise ships and a uh, couple comments about the fact that we never see pictures of where the crew slept. It's actually true. And the, the diagram I showed of the, um, the warship has no crew's quarters. Uh, and that's really because they just strung their hammocks above the, the chests and above the barrels. And, you know, there was not actually a, you know, maybe yes for the officers but not for the the crew so anyways they were also kind of hidden in the belly of the ships so i remember in a galley they actually did sometimes show where the sick um uh crewmen were supposed to go is that true for the ships that you look at i haven't seen i mean i've never seen such a detailed until preparing for this talk this was like a, a gold mine with this one uh with this one image yeah that's interesting right a sick bay at least should show up yeah. What what um, what's interesting for me is <clears throat> looking through the uh, drawings of the ships from the 1600s and 1700s and all the navies. Very rarely do you see what we would call today a general arrangements, which showed where the major um, parts of the ship were, not just the hull shape, but uh, and the mass, but where the um, uh, where the quarters were, um, how the ship was divided internally. Uh, you'd see frames, you'd see major structures but nothing to indicate um, how things were laid out. Um, and only much later did you actually start to see drawings of stowage. Um, I saw them mostly in these French uh, uh, Academy of Science prizes as opposed to regular drawings that were submitted as part of the overall package that uh, had to be approved by the bureaucracy. And that was true, you know, not just for the French Navy, but Spanish and, and British. They didn't seem to pay much attention to the internal arrangements. Okay, I'm looking. I'm looking at Jason because Jason is um, that uh, suggesting that that we are supposed to have a break, but I'm just wondering if we go um, because we realize it's been a rather long day for everyone. Um, so Jason, I have a few, just um, if this is okay, Jason with you, I think we just go right into some, a few general points that each of us picked out for the day. Um, and then any sort of final words before we say goodbye. Jason, do you wanna start with two and then I'll do two? Sure thing, sure thing. Um, hold on, let me bring up the notes. So first and foremost, I would like to thank everybody who gave fascinating papers um, today. I know it was, it was very rich and rewarding for me. Uh, Christy and I, during the course of the day, uh, shared some general ideas and some broader themes that course through a lot of the talks. Um, and I'll just read out two of them. And the first, uh, which I suppose in many ways speaks to the kind of topics that were discussed in, in infrastructure, raised the question of the difficult balance between the local and the global. Noting, of course, that chips are mobile objects, right? And we, we were thinking them here as kind of architectural machines with a requirement for both buoyancy and mobility. And I think they raised the question of how we consider these objects. Uh, at the one time, there are objects that traverse large, large huge large distances, but are also tethered to very local conditions, local forms of expertise, um, local geopolitical um, circumstances, uh, as well as the kind of unique climatic uh, situation of each, of each um, um, well, where they were made, that specifically, thinking of local topographies, tides, climates, customs, practices, and resources. Uh, another, 
issue that seemed to course through is the relationship between communities and communications. Um, thinking about, as was referenced earlier, I think in Meredith, when Meredith is speaking about um, the ship as per Siegert's theorization of it as a kind of form of media and as a kind of cultural techniques, thinking about the involvement this has between the human and the non-human, also thinking about the community of the ship and the kind of the spaces or, or how the, the, the kind of communities or the social organizations that the ship engenders. This is certainly something that Nicholas Mock um, and Elliot Sertavant raised very specifically in terms of either a kind of theorized or mythologized um, kind of society. Um, and this also raises or speaks to one of the things that Frida Meyer referenced here, which was actually thinking about the ship as an infrastructure that has its own unique aesthetic dimension to it and a kind of symbolic function to it. So those were just two issues, I suppose, which is thinking about the ship in terms of the kind of delicate balance between understanding the local and the global, as well as thinking of it um, in terms of its communicative um, or mediated operation. And I'll hand it over to you, Christy. Um, one of a uh, third topic, which we saw come out in many of the papers, but especially I'd say this afternoon was the question about expertise and technology. Um, where does expertise lie? Where does knowledge lie? Um, how is it sometimes, um, let's say, contained or controlled, um, communicated through prints through manuscripts. Um, so where, how does that knowledge move? And how does it move in ways that we can't easily as historians trace? So when it moves orally, when it moves through practice, when it moves through kinds of communication, which are not necessarily written down, how can we find ways to understand that and lo locate that? This also brought up um, which came up in so many different ways. I thought it came up in Nicholas's talk. Um, uh, it certainly came up in Meredith and Jillian's talk, but what we might want to loosely call the arts of the sea, um, which could certainly be artistic imagery, artistic imagery of ships, imagery of ships and communities, which are, let's say, embedded in ways that are not particularly technical, but are very much part of uh, cultural exchange, whether it's within one location or across various places. So that's certainly um, that idea of sort of sea arts. And then, of course, that's not just about what we might want to call, say, the art of the um, the sort of fine arts, but also all, all of the other arts, navigation, um, the shipwright and the architect is parallel as Larry discussed, um, all sorts of questions about uh, uh, social standing of the worker and labor. Who are these people? Where are they? Do we see them? How do we follow their traces? What kind of evidence is available for understanding them? So all of those sort of of which there are many others as well about this idea of expertise and technology. And one of the things that I thought was really interesting, and um, Jillian talked about this, Preda talked about this, is those, those moments when we often tend to think of knowledge as sort of just going out, like a kind of a wave going out into the ocean. But of course, there were very important moments when it stayed very close to home, when it was meant to not be disseminated. It wasn't meant, um, it was a either state secret, it was a professional skill, it was something which had to be kept uh, close, close to hand. So that's number three. And then um, the final one, which was sort of more broadly, and Sarah certainly brought this up, Elliot, um, it came up in, in various talks about image making and the ship. Um, so the ship as architecture, what are those overlaps between the structure of the ship um, as an object, I mean, if we want to say as a thing, which is out sort of in the world, what kinds of image um, images are created around it. So even if the ship were not there, the ship exists in some kind of um, a mental construct or in a visual construct. So the ship is media. Um, and then other issues that certainly come out from this, issues about cartography, issues about navigation, um, popular culture. I mean, the wonderful things that Nicholas showed of the cruise ship and the kind of advertisement and popularization. Elliot also showed this. Um, 
So, you know, that, that, those sort of four big ideas and, you know, I mean, I actually will throw it out to the panelists. I mean, what are there other things that when Jason and I were, were brainstorming um, that also might sort of other areas of uh, overlap or exchange that, that you also see or kind of comments that you might make from this? Throw the throw. Oh, everyone's it's the end of a long day. I, I just have a, a kind of follow up comment yeah. question to that, which is, you know, this, this idea of the arts of the sea. And, you know, we talk a lot about kind of the the blue humanities. And I, I don't know that art history as a discipline has really grappled <laughs> with this concept as much as, you know, architectural history or maybe early modern history or some other aspects or, you know, history of science and technology. But, um, you know, I'm thinking about all of these kind of manuals or volumes I think that I've come across in different national libraries that show, you know, artists who are going on maritime voyages who may or may not belong to the, you know, the, the nationality of the ship, which itself is composed of a very kind of <laughs> polyglot international community, including people, you know, local and, and global. And not only are, are they themselves, you know, part of this kind of mixed or hybrid community or whatever you want to call it, but the work that they make too, it, it really, you know, puts pressure on these kind of boundaries that we've set up, whether they're national boundaries, geographical boundaries, sometimes even like intermedial. And and I, I just wonder, since there's a whole group of, of specialists here, um, if anyone has any thoughts on that or maybe recommendations for people who you've read who have kind of grappled with this question, should we create some kind of big visual database where people can dump all, I mean, I have, you know, I've seen like wonderful examples of a manuscript at the Bayonet, for instance, which shows different kinds of typologies of, of ships, of boats in Siam and, you know, in Thailand during the 1680s. And so much of the kind of the way that this artist, whoever he or she, probably he may be, is representing this ship comes from a kind of what seems to be a sort of knowledge about ships in a kind of Mediterranean context, which is then translated and sort of filtered through this, this context. And it's the kind of, you know, to do this kind of work, I feel like we as a community also have to be very kind of interdisciplinary and, and um, you know, sort of broad in terms of our own training or specialization, but I just wanted to throw that out there as a kind of question or provocation to, to think about how we might deal with that, things like that. I mean, if I can just uh, um, um, respond to that, Meredith, a little bit. I mean, I really um, love what, what you said there, and it, it makes me also think of, again, some of the issues that were raised by many of the talks um, today, which is, you know, this, um, you know, a question of translation and question of, um, you know, sort of heterogeneous communities and also heterogeneous um, materials that we look at, right, that we are, we tend to be trained, of course, um, as area study specialists or period, you know, particular period specialists. But if you embrace the aquatic or the oceanic or the blue as a framework, then um, it becomes, you know, sort of veris, you know, vociferously um, transhistorical and transmedia and transdisciplinary. But then there's always the danger of it just sort of like floating away into generalizations. And then you get sort of like seduced by these grand macro scales. And then you see sameness everywhere and there's connections everywhere. Um, and then there's a tension of, you know, then everything is commensurable and everything becomes easily translatable, right? But the other, you know, but of course, in reality, uh, like living on a ship, as you so beautifully pointed out, with a crew of people who speak many different languages, actually, you know, the challenge of translation and making, actually uh, understanding each other, you know, there's actually beautiful work in the Indian Ocean on um, the culture of merchants and the culture and the incredible sort of genius ability by merchants, for example, to translate constantly across multiple currency uh, systems, multiple um, sh shipping um, and navigational technologies and norms. 
So, you know, again, in some ways, what I'm saying is not, you know, so very tied well together. It's just a response to the things you were saying. And, you know, maybe as a takeaway, we would maybe want to embrace sort of the the strategies of merchants um, who are oftentimes, again, masters of translation and trying to make sense of multiple uh, modes uh, and systems of communication. I mean, just to, to jump in there, I, I don't know if people have seen, it came up pretty recently, which is um, Deborah Howard published an article on what happened, what did people actually do on Venetian galleys during long voyages? Like, where did they pray? Where did they sleep? How, you know, sort of how did they pass the time? on board ships in the 16th, 17th centuries. Um, I can try to find the link and put that in. But I mean, those seem really interesting questions to me. I mean, what did actually people do all day when they were on on these boats? Um, And sort of, I mean, also this issue about not seeing spaces designated for this or for that, because it's, I mean, I assume because they were multifunctional mm-hmm. spaces, which changed out depending on, you know, what happened at what particular time. But um, I mean, I think that's a whole, this idea of the shipboard community, the diversity, but the actual activities that happened, um, which I think is out there. It just hasn't been sort of, I mean, for me, it hasn't been brought into the discussion enough that would be interesting to know. One last thing I just wanted to add, which really um, caught my attention um, from uh, looking, listening to some of the papers today is, you know, there, we may, might have to pay more attention, and I say this to myself too, to the um, difference between, you know, the, you know, how representation works or how pictorial representation of ships, of lives of technologies work, you know, as a pictorial strategy versus what they represent, right? So we oftentimes use images as if they are, you know, the same as the object. Again, I speak to my own issues here, um, but there's, there were, I think there was a lot of that sort of like, you know, shifting easily between though the representational and the material as if they are actually the same and, and they're not. Yep. I just wanted to jump in your point about the ship as media it just seems like such a neat way to you know maybe draw together so many of the papers and you know Meredith you're saying well like we think about the art of the sea um, and I'm used to thinking about uh, you know for instance these companies as huge producers of bureaucratic information so I think about that from the book historians perspective so like art historians book historians historians of technology um, and I guess you think, well, is it media within which things are being written or are they doing the writing? Like it's just a really evocative uh, phrase and maybe uh, a call for another conference or something, but thanks for that. We don't, Let's we just don't please have... don't have the next uh, conference on Utopia. <laughs> Or, or maybe we should, maybe we should try to get a floating um, conference, <laughs> part two. Uh, um, okay, Jason, do we have final? I think everybody's really tired, the end of, oops, muted. Jason, you're muted. I've been so good with that all day. You have to move. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we can conclude here. I would again like to, um, if I could, just to share the screen for a moment to, to thank a number of people. Um, again, at the Den, John H. Daniels, Faculty of Architecture, Landscape and Design for supporting this endeavor. Again, Dean Juan Du, Robert Levitt, Jimmy Kim, Peter Seeley, Tim and Hamid um, and Katrina and all those who came and zoomed in and last but certainly not least as our presenters. So thank you very much um, for joining us and helping all of us think through this question uh, for its social, technological and environmental complexities. Um, all of those who are interested in this topic, please do take a visit to the website, cmachines.org. We have shared the bios and the abstracts for everybody's papers, as well as links to 
publications, uh, specifically the recent publications that our panelists here have um, published. Uh, they were shared certainly throughout the day, but all that information is also located um, on the website. Um, I would like to say that the next event in the Daniels Faculty Winter 2022 program uh, is Thinking Like a Mountain. So it's coming up next Thursday, uh, February 10th at 12 o'clock noon. Um, and the link has been shared in the chat. And it is also located on the website at danielsite.utoronto.ca. Uh, we hope to see you online again very soon. And have a lovely evening and have a nice weekend, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Good night. Good Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye, Bye. 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 Bye.